Welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and we're truly excited today, believe me, more than uh, you could ever know. Uh, we have um, one who I believe is uh, one of the premier thinkers and, and uh, top leaders, uh, African Americans, but really anywhere uh, that we have in the nation today is one who is the chairperson of the legislative Black Caucus in the state of Louisiana, right there in Baton Rouge, we have one uh, representative, Patricia Haynes Smith. Welcome. Welcome. Um, thank you for having me here today, and I no. uh, appreciate being here. We're excited. Uh, you were here before, and, yes. and, and just honored to have you again. Um, a lot of great things going on. Now, I don't know about great things, but major things <laughs> right. going on in Baton Rouge sure. uh, right now. To me, the first off, I'd like to um, touch upon, because uh, to me, it's uh, the biggest issue of our time right now, and it's the incarceration rate of African American males. Louisiana, number one in the world, bar none, uh, like you say, Iraq all over, um, mostly drug crimes. <coughs> Your That's thoughts? Correct. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, 47% or more of our prison population is in there for some drug crime, crime of some sort. Wow. That's a lot of folk. Yeah. Uh, that's being put in prison. And and one of the things that I think in Louisiana that we don't have enough of are drug treatment programs. Right. And th that's the preventive side. So uh, yeah. we arrest people for usage right. um, more than we do oftentimes for distribution. Wow. And then that's unfortunate. But uh, if we were able to get folks into treatment programs that had enough of them, we could reduce that population. Um, in fact, I, uh, the, in Kentucky, there is a program in Kentucky where their incarceration rate is uh, very low uh, compared to Louisiana, but they have a phased-in program. And the first phase is if you're arrested for drug crimes, mm -hmm. you go through treatment automatic. Okay. Automatically, you go through treatment. Okay. Their second phase is if you need, if you've committed something, uh, for instance, a burglary or something, and right. you still need to be incarcerated, right. then you can go through a minimum security kind of a program okay. rather than you know going up to some of our other, like we have in Louisiana, our right. other prisons. Right. But you know, even just today in our joint budget, you know, we were uh, moving around some drug treatment programs that you know I, I'm concerned about might get lost in the shuffle because they're moving from the Department of Health and Hospitals over to the Department of Children and Family Services. So, you know, we, we, we don't look at it in a, a very logical manner, in my opinion. Which, which, which is true because uh, there, there are, the professionals are, are saying over and over again, if they have the proper funding and uh, that they can work with, you know, people using drugs. And, and, and then the flip side is that, you know, we have Oregon and Washington, are, uh, you know, recognizing that, hey, not even... Uh, being concerned, but let me uh, throw this in. We're speaking to Representative Lepinto, who has great uh, admiration for you and uh, respect, uh, but extremely conservative. The argument was is that the amount of people that are arrested uh, for drugs is disproportionately African American, right. but we know the people who use drugs are predominantly white, Caucasian, uh, but we're going to jail. And so the argument was is that uh, where that's happening, somebody needs to look at that because, that, uh, you know, uh, regardless of how many calls the police are getting, the arrest rate should be the same right. if we had justice and fairness. <laughs> and, and that is very true. Uh, you'll find that there are more policemen on beats in our African-American inner city neighborhoods, yeah. uh, and they tend to stop people often. You know, in areas where they figure there's high drug crime usage or, uh, or distribution, right. and of course, as you mentioned, our folks will call, yeah. you know, as well to report, right. uh, whereas others may not report it they uh, as much. But the most important thing is that even if these things are done, uh, we ought to be looking at how there is that uh, disparate impact. Right. on the African-American community right. and maybe look at some legislation or resolution or something down the way right. to be able to find out where this is occurring. It might also be an eye-opener for law enforcement on where are drugs coming into 
areas Come on. more prevalently. Come on, poor people don't bring yes, drugs in. Yes, right, <laughs> exactly right, because you know we don't actually bring the drugs in, they're simply right. brought in by someone else. Exactly. And, uh, and it might be something that would give them an eye opener as well if we were able to have some way, means of being able to look at the trends and the data and being able to uh, hone in on those areas and parishes that have more arrest. Hey, well, we're, I, I think, you know, the listeners are, and I think everybody, because, uh, you know, th this drug usage is affecting at least the arrest for drug usage, and that's the yeah. point. It's not the drug usage, uh, because we have tons of professionals, psychiatrists <laughs> and toxicologists are saying that uh, the drug usage issue, even though it's not that it's not a problem, but it's not as bad as alcohol. Yeah. And uh, but what is the problem is when you have in some neighborhoods, 70 percent of the African-American males are in prison. Uh, children don't have fathers. I mean, there's no men around, you know. That's it, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it is a, it's a, uh, a visual thing that, you know, we see constantly and our children see it as well when the police are prevalent and they're arresting people. So uh, we've got to do something about it. There's no doubt about it. Hey, I think you're the right person. I think, yes, indeed. <coughs> yes, indeed. Now, well, let's move on to the big issue. I mean, well, that's the big issue, but, you know, we're, we're moved there. But the next one, health care. Our governor um, <coughs> has made uh, a decision uh, to um, reject Medicaid expansion Correct. as a part of the Affordable Care Act. Let's right. Talk about it. Unfortunate. <laughs> there are over 900,000 individuals in Louisiana who are um, uninsured. And there's a large percentage of them that are on uh, are the working poor, a very large percentage. If you expanded Medicaid in Louisiana to 133% of poverty, we would end up picking up approximately 400,000 more individuals wow. to be able to have health insurance. Okay. <clears throat> and with that in mind, they would have access to not only the Medicaid, but then you'd have the working poor who have jobs right. who could be able to buy insurance through the health exchange program right. if the state were to put in their own, but the feds are gonna put one in as well, but right. unfortunately it's gonna be a little bit different than if the state were to uh, put one in for themselves. So him deciding to not take that is going to cause a large ripple effect, I believe, in the state of Louisiana because of the fact that on top of not taking the Medicare, uh, not going with the Medicaid expansion, and then the changes to the LSU healthcare system will impact the access to care as well as individuals who just will not be able to get uh, through a hospital because we're going with public-private partnerships, uh, we're looking at uh, a reduction in our uncompensated care costs from the federal government, which is going to reduce that amount. If you reduce that amount and you don't expand Medicaid, you're automatically going to have people not getting insurance. Sounds good. We're going to take a minute now, um, and we'll be back shortly. Stay tuned. Uh, trust me, this is a great show, a great opportunity to, uh, to learn about what's going on in our state. Thank you so much. friendlier cars and trucks. Smartway certified cars and trucks are more fuel efficient, produce fewer greenhouse gases, and can save you money. And when you're helping the environment, it's a nice reflection on you. Smartway, because it's time America turned over a new leaf. Follow the leaf. Go to www.epa.gov smartway. 
Jazz was created in Louisiana. It's reality, man. Letting people know how you feel. You can't talk about jazz without talking about Louis Armstrong. He's the beginning of it, the middle, and the end of it. I love Frenchman Street. It's like you're being bombarded with this culture. And these guys play with such passion, they make you want to perform. Come check it out for yourself. <laughs> I'm Terrence Blanchard, and this is my Louisiana. Real seniors, real concerns. The economy is my concern. Will we outlive our money? Medication. Rent is really more than some of us can afford. You do without a lot. And nobody comes to tell us what our rights are, what we can fight for. If I can get any kind of information that would help other seniors, I would let them know. For information, contact the Senior Citizens League at 1-800-333-8725 or seniorsleague.org. Great, thanks for staying with us. And we're continuing the conversation now um, with Representative Patricia Haynes-Smith concerning Medicaid. So go, go ahead. Yeah, and you know, the interesting part about the Medicaid expansion um, is that the state wouldn't have any cost uh, for, for a number of years uh, right. if they actually did this. Um, expanding Medicaid, the federal government would pay 100%, 100% of the cost wow up until 2016, and then it reduces down to 90%. Overall, by 2022, uh, the state's cost would be, uh, when one, the whole total cost for the, for the program would be $26.8 billion, okay. with the state only having to pay $1.8 billion. Small percentage. So you're absolutely right. Um, and, and then you'd have people being healthy. You'd have healthy people, you'd have, uh, you'd have a, a program where people had insurance to be able to go to the doctor, you know, where your companies uh, were not able to afford insurance, that people who are working poor be able to go in at health exchange and f find that menu of insurance companies that would be able to help them. I think it's a win-win for us if the governor would just acquiesce to the point that it's a necessity. And in some ways he has, um, because uh, we found out recently that Louisiana was one of the states that applied for a waiver. Interesting. The waiver would have provided him, uh, Louisiana, the opportunity to um, expand Medicaid, but only up to 100% of poverty. And of course, they were denied. They said this cannot be a partial um, program. It has right. to be one where you do, uh, you're do. you all in. You're all in or you're all out, right, <laughs> basically. Right, right. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how he uh, portrays this down the road because he knows, he knows very well, our hospitals know very well that with the changes and transformation we're making in health care, that if the Affordable Care Act is not put in place, an expansion of Medicaid, we will not have people having health care, getting access to health care. They will still be going to emergency rooms. Hospitals will bear the brunt of the uninsured costs. Correct. Uh, and when that cost is gone, it's gone. That money's gone, it's gone. Right. You don't have any more. So, uh, this is something that I believe that we as a people in Louisiana can encourage and, and enrage, <laughs> right. do all of those things necessary right. to make the governor realize that this is something that's truly needed in Louisiana. Well, and let's talk a little bit about the ability to put pressure in, in, in Baton Rouge, you know, because say uh, we're here in New Orleans. <laughs> This affects broad swaths of the population, oh, yes. other than the, you know, again, the uh, Governor Romney's upper echelon group. Uh, what are the best ways to put pressure? Because he obviously he has some support in the legislature, but it seems to be waning right now. Right. The best way to put pressure on the governor is to inundate him, not only with emails and phone calls, but also for people to be at the Capitol. Now, the AARP group is very diligent. Your seniors are very diligent. Okay. When they when they come to the Capitol, they come in busloads. Okay. Those individuals, but not only them, it has to come from ordinary people who okay. uh, or who understand the impact that if you are healthy right. and you have insurance, then right. why shouldn't your neighbor who's struggling on a job 
and not making a lot of money right. have the same opportunity, especially if they're working in a company with That's 50 right. or more employees. That's right. Yeah. They should have the access to health care as well. It, it almost, <coughs> it's literally almost to me, we're dealing with a moral argument. I agree. How yes. can we actually allow people, you know, to end up dying of heart attacks and diabetes right. and cancer right. when we have an, how, how, you know, Again, if somebody speaks of conservatism or whatever, supposedly uh, they're saying from a moral, ethical standpoint, but here we're looking yeah. at evil. <laughs> yeah, you're just about right. Um, it, it is, in my opinion, a moral issue because it, it takes on the psyche of saying that if I don't do this, I'm really not concerned about the poor in my state. Right. And you have to be concerned about the poor because we are one of the poorest states in the country. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be. Right. Some of the highest poverty levels of our children living in poverty. Right. And when you don't look at, you know, the overall picture right. of how you can provide a healthier Louisiana, and this being a means of being able to do that, right. you know, rather than denying individuals access, being able to give access to people is just so much more important. And then I would think even secondly, the next argument is a business argument. Why would a business want to locate here where you have so many people that are sick and so uh, bad health care goes right. along with poor education, exactly. goes along with, you know, poverty and everything That's else? exactly right. You know, and one of the arguments, of course, that it's being used is uh, for about businesses. And you've seen some of the businesses across the country who uh, started out saying they were going to reduce all their people to part-time workers so they wouldn't have to worry about paying them um, uh, or getting health care for right, them. Right. Well, that's not, they, they've stopped it now. They're not going right. to do that. Right. So they made that decision that it's, it's better to have healthy people working than to have unhealthy people working. Yes. Yeah, but the, the major thing is that if, if those companies who have 50 or more employees right. are already offering something, then you're doing okay. But if you're not offering health care, then allow those individuals to purchase that health care through the exchange programs. Okay. Uh, and if you and and then you uh, you know that your your folks are going to be able to get to work every day. Right. They won't be calling in sick as much. So you're giving them the opportunity to really make your business better. In my opinion. You got it. Now, let's look at these, the, the cuts, because uh, during the, um, our governor's ad administration, he instituted a number of, uh, let's see, uh, tax cuts, educational tax cuts, mm -hmm. which really took a big uh, chunk of revenue away to pay bills. Yes. Um, he's instituted a lot of uh, tax credits and exemptions, you know, via the legislature. Um, by having individuals introduce these bills. And um, he's still looking again at, at revising our tax code, which is going to fall more in favor of, you know, how businesses can be better um, applied in Louisiana than I think ordinary people. But we have billions of dollars in tax credits and exemptions on the books. Some of them have been in existence since the 1930s. And there's just no way that I, I, I believe that those are doing any justice today. Okay. But he's made it very clear that if we find tax exemptions or credits that can be eliminated, that they need to be revenue neutral, meaning any revenue that you were still able to glean from them, you have to, you cannot use it in your budget. You have to just eliminate it. And that to me, in a, in a cash poor state, which is what we are, a cash poor state right now, right. because there is no new revenue really coming into our state. Every year when we get new revenue through our oil royalties or those monies, income taxes, or <clears throat> those ways of means that we, means of financing that we have, right. We're always in a, a hole. We got a billion dollars, a, a billion dollars in a hole for the 13, 2013 budget. So we've got to use those monies in some way to pay for the debt that we've made already. Not being able to look at how you're going to enhance anything, but you're always constantly covering up cuts. That's not the way to run a business. And if they're talking about a state being this business, that's truly not the way to run a business. Now. Help me understand. You know, what is there any rationale for this plan? I mean, this is horrible. I mean, just basic math. All right, you yeah. reduce taxes, but you're not yeah. investing in education. I mean, what? what, what, what I wish there on? was rationale, uh, Chris. Um, 
The rationale I see with Governor Jindal right now is that he's running for president. Okay. Anything that he can do to make him seem like a staunch conservative, irregardless of who is impacted by what he does, okay. is what he's doing. All right. And uh, even when you look at the educational system, right. and uh, I, I would say when we first got into the legislature in 08, the state was paying 75% of um, funding to higher ed. Okay. Parents and students were paying 25%. Right. That has totally flip-flopped now. State paying 25%, students and parents are paying 75% wow. by raising tuition and by, you know, the fees and what have you. But but and, and sometimes in some instances that's not bad because some folks can afford it. Okay. But then they're not looking at those individuals who you're cutting out of the pipeline right. to be able to get a good education. Um, and to me, there's as we uh, I don't think we had this conversation, but the conversation we had regarding this was that we're trying to send a lot more people to two-year colleges. Yeah, That's not awesome. bad if the two-year college has a uh, articulation agreement with a four-year that will entice a young person after they've gone for two years, right. then they can go like a junior college. Correct. Then they can go to a four-year and finish a degree. Right. But we've never had that kind of communication or partnerships. We've just started them. So even just like our uh, community college system is brand new, this is a brand new concept for us as well. So people can go to community colleges, but they may not be able to even go on to a four-year college. <laughs> they and, can now, okay. but it's just started. It just you know because of the fact that they've realized that uh, they've come, some have come to the realization that they say we have too many people in four-year colleges. Well, I don't believe you have too many people in four-year colleges. I believe that access for anyone who wants to go to four-year colleges ought to be there. But even if they need to go for uh, developmental programs because That's you've right. cut out all of your remediation at four-year, right. if they go to, go to two-year for developmental programs and they become up to speed right. and they stay there for two years, there ought to be a means of that young person saying, now I'm ready to go and finish my degree That's right. at the school I wanted to go to. That's right. LSU and Southern have both put in programs like that with BRCC. Great. And Southern has also uh, done something unique by putting a satellite campus of their Shreveport two-year college on the Baton Rouge campus. So they have students who can enroll in the, the, uh, the satellite campus of the Shreveport um, uh, Susala, and okay. then be right on Southern's campus and they can automatically nurture those young people to remain at Southern for four years. I understand, understand. <laughs> so, um, but healthcare and education are only two places that right. can be cut by these uh, higher ed, Higher ed, higher uh, ed, because K-12 is also protected through the MFP. Um, but higher ed and health care are the two areas that receive more state general funds than any other program, yes. So that's where cuts come from, generally, when we have these uh, mid-year cuts or what have you uh, that we have to look at, yes. Okay. Now, these public-private partnerships with the hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about that. And well. I can talk about mostly the one in, uh, in Baton Rouge, but if you just read recently in New Orleans, that's one that's coming up where the brand new hospital that's being built here in New Orleans, brand spanking new, <laughs> too big. Yeah, is going to be leased out to um, a nonprofit that oversees Turo and Children's Hospital. Okay. And that not, that private public partnership is going to is supposed to ensure that there will be access for individuals to be able to get to the hospital through the Medicaid program or through the uninsured program, uncompensated care program. Okay. And uh, it's just going to be that, and of course I'm sure that two row and children's will have access into that program, into that hospital as well. Okay. But. We don't know how that's going to end up because it's not yet as fully vetted as we know it's uh, it's going to come down the pike. But in in Baton Rouge, we have a uh, cooperative endeavor agreement with Our Lady of the Lake for Earl K. Long. Okay. Earl K. Long is going to close. We know that they will cease bringing any patients into the old hospital. Okay. And as you know, they couldn't build it because it's a very deteriorated structure anyway. So the lake, Our Lady of the Lake, decided that they would take over everything from. 
uh, Earl K. Long with the exception of prisoner care, and of course they didn't do OBGYN. They didn't do birth. So women's has a contract for birthing for um, uh, for pregnancies, okay. and they're looking at still still have not decided permanently what they're going to do with prisoners because um, prisoners go through the private system. Okay. I mean the public system. Okay. But Earl K. Long will take over all the inpatient bed care that was that Ali of the Lake was taking over from Earl K. Long, if I said that wrong. Ali of the Lake is taking over all the inpatient beds services from Earl K. Long. Right. And in addition, just recently there is going to be an announcement to show that they're going to put the clinics that Earl K. Long has in Baton Rouge under the the lake's um, governance as well. Wow. So that means the clinics will be able to stay open, but that, that means that the lake is going to have to do some changes in their policy right. uh, to ensure that the clinics are run and that people know that the clinics are still available for them to be able to be used. Right. So um, it is a, an opportunity for LSU to get out of facilities totally. They will not own or operate any facilities dealing with health care. Okay. All of it goes into the private sector. They will still provide funding and they will still provide the uh, edu medical education programs that they have in place. But as far as dealing with a facility and its infrastructure, they no longer want will have that on their hands. We are praying that our people who utilize these public-private partnerships will still be able to access the kind of health care that they need. And we all have to be vigilant, uh, diligent and vigilant in making sure that when complaints are made that they're taken care of immediately. Is it, uh, and we just have a few seconds, uh, the key, is there any guarantee that these private partner, public partnerships will be accepting all of the poor people who would normally inundate the charity hospital system? Well, I, I should say there's no guarantee, but there's definitely uh, an agreement that they have to say that they will definitely have those individuals come through their hospitals. But we have to watch it. We have to watch it. Well, Got to uh, watch it. Got to keep your eyes open. <laughs> got, well, the, we, 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 we thank you. We're, we're so excited. But I think the, the, the key thing is uh, what she says is that to learn to listen, but we have to go to Baton Rouge. We have to fight. We have to do what's necessary right. because we have to protect the poor. We have to protect the weak. And in fact, it's literally the middle class. Everybody will be destroyed. Thank you so much, Representative. We appreciate you. Thank you. Fight as hard as you can. Catch us on the web, healthissues2010.org. But tell somebody to make a difference. Thank you so much.